Welcome to the Healthcare Cloud Evolution Panel with executive experts from Clear Data and Amazon Web Services. Thanks for joining us for what's going to prove to be a really lively and compelling discussion on one of the hottest topics in healthcare technology circles today, the cloud. I'm Mandy Bishop, your moderator. I'm the founder and CEO of Aloha Knows, which is a cloud-enabled startup providing solutions to assess and address the impact of social and behavioral determinants of health on communities and healthcare entities. I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce our panelists and allow them to tell us a bit about themselves and their roles. Joining me today are Scott White, the Senior Vice President of Growth and Innovation at Clear Data. Thanks so much for joining us, Scott. Great to have you. Thank you, Mandy. It's uh, great to be here with you and our panelists and all the participants. Uh, been a 30-year healthcare IT veteran and working in pharma and payer and provider and hospital and even software settings and uh, just amazing times right now uh, as we see changes and uh, more rapid adoption of the cloud. So looking forward to an engaging discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Next up, we have Oksana Pickerel, who is the global segment leader for healthcare and life sciences at Amazon Web Services. Oksana, thank you so much for being here. Tell us a bit about yourself. Thank you, Mandy, for the intro, and a uh, pleasure to meet everybody on this webinar. Um, I um, lead our global engagement with the partner ecosystem for AWS, uh, Healthcare and Life Sciences, so work with both consulting and technology partners worldwide that are building solutions on the AWS platform. Um, myself have been in uh, the field in this industry for more than 20 years um, in a variety of roles from pharma R&D, genomics, uh, going all the way back to the early days of the Human Genome Project, and then worked in telehealth, worked in healthcare communication, uh, did a variety of work in healthcare data and analytics in the past. Um, really, really looking forward to an engaging dialogue here. Wonderful. Wow. I know we are as well. Next up, we have Matt Ferrari, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Clear Data. I appreciate your being here today, Matt. Good morning, everyone from beautiful Arizona. My name is Matt Ferrari. I'm the uh, Chief Technology Officer, as mentioned, for Clear Data. So I'm in charge of all of our product strategy um, as it relates to healthcare, life science, um, as well as providers, payers, um, and healthcare technology organizations, which we're going to talk about today. We partner directly with AWS for all of our services. So I think this, this discussion today will be very interesting and, and hopefully very lively. Excellent. And last, but certainly not least, we have Chris Bowen, who is the Founder and Chief Privacy and Security Officer at Clear Data. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Mandy. Pleasure to be here. My job is, uh, you guessed it, uh, privacy and security. Uh, a big part of my job is to help our customers uh, migrate in a way that uh, addresses the security and the privacy concerns of, of them and their customers and their patients. Uh, this is uh, a worldwide um, uh, effort in many cases, and so uh, navigating some of those compliance challenges is a, a topic that comes up quite a bit. Matt uh, uh, gets the, the privilege of productizing all of those, uh, the, the patchwork, patch, the quilted patchwork of regulations in his products, and, uh, and so we're, we're excited to have this, this dialogue uh, on that topic. I'm sure we're going to be weaving the conversation about privacy and security throughout any of the threads that we cover today. It's really key. So thanks for everybody. Before we get into it, for the viewers, I wanna let you know that we're encouraging active participation throughout the discussion. This panel is for you, and we wanna make sure that we cover your burning questions. So the team and I are gonna be watching the chat window that can be accessed using the chat icon at the bottom of the screen. I'll do my best to interject any audience submitted questions or comments as appropriate into the natural flow of the conversation. After today's panel, the topics that were covered in addition to the questions and responses provided and any questions that we weren't able to address will be made available in a post-event follow-up for all registered attendees. So don't hesitate to ask, please do, we want to hear from you. And as a bonus, we'll periodically be posing questions to the audience to optimize the interactive experience. So let's get those fingers warmed up. It looks like we've got a, a bunch of participants already online. Using the chat window, which you can access by clicking the little chat icon, the little message icon at the bottom of your screen, respond and tell us, how ready is your organization for the cloud? While we're getting those responses in, I'd like to hear a little bit from Scott 
about the status of cloud in the healthcare industry today. Thanks, Mandy, and yeah, eager to hear the feedback. Uh, I'm thankful in my role that I get to speak with healthcare leaders across the country routinely, day to day, and these are both business and IT leaders across all segments of the industry, pharma, payer, provider, software, SaaS leaders. And uh, as I speak with them, you know, they're wrestling with the macro issues of healthcare, uh, moves to value-based care, uh, focus on, on population health and consumer and patient engagement. So they're passionate about changing healthcare and they're, they're connecting the dots but to what, what IT tools uh, do I need. And the cloud, of course, comes up as, as one of those potential tools. As I look back at myself as a provider CIO and then an enterprise IT executive, I was an early adopter to the cloud and, 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 and dabbled in it and, and, and found some great advantages and, and, and moved uh, heavier into it. And, and I'm seeing some of those that same sort of progression. So uh, two, three years ago, the question was, um, could we move to the cloud? And then it, it, the question was, should we move to the cloud? And now I am hearing, how can we move to the cloud? So there's a very significant uh, transition. And uh, again, I think, it's an, I think it's an exciting time. Um, uh, customers or prospects and, and leaders are looking for what are those first projects and um, how do I get started? And then they're also starting to say, you know, what are the specific security concerns or compliance concerns? What type of staffing and talent do I need? Um, how do I design and architect both for scalability and security and all the agility uh, and the benefits of the cloud? So um, uh, good opportunities, but still some challenges out there that uh, need to be wrestled with. Absolutely. It sounds like there's a tremendous amount of opportunity and in looking at the responses that we're seeing from the audience, it seems like everyone who is watching who is chiming in is indicating that they are in fact engaged in the cloud to some extent already and that this migration to the cloud may be in process along some of their lines of business um, and that progression to the cloud is, is rampant amongst our audience. So I'd like to hear from a technology perspective from Matt Ferrari how are you seeing that migration to the cloud from a technology, you know, from the technology standpoint, how are you seeing that progressing and where are the opportunities that you see that are upcoming in the next, you know, in the next year or so for our audience members to take advantage of? Sure. So first off, it's important to know that um, I'm, I'm seeing tremendous gravity in this direction. I had the opportunity to speak at um, AWS reInvent as an example uh, and saw that there are a tremendous amount of, uptick in providers, payers, pharmaceutical companies attending cloud-based events, whether it be AWS or other events that are focusing on how can I move PHI into the cloud? But look, they're, they're thinking about what, what are the heavy considerations? And today we're, we're gonna be talking a lot about security and compliance, but security and compliance is top of mind for most of these organizations. How do I successfully move protected health information out of my data center, out of my hospital, into the cloud? and the neat thing is that there are a tremendous amount of services that are technology services um, at large, but the, over time they're being um, developed to align with um, compliance things such as PCI and, and HIPAA guidelines and things like that that we can talk about at, at length today. But the exciting thing is that we're starting to see a lot of gravity specifically around big data projects, around interoperability projects as organizations are looking to actually do something with the data and build scalability into the model. Absolutely, Oksana, is this your experience with AWS as well? I'd like to hear about how AWS is considering these problems, these opportunities. Absolutely, yes. And um, I think what's really interesting in recent years is how much the tone of conversation around technology has changed. So if a couple of years ago, you know, starting with security, a lot of people were asking a question of, can I, can I be secure in the cloud? Today, in uh, you know, traveling through some of the same circles that Scott described, um, it's it's really interesting how many CIOs, CTOs, um, other C-level executives tell us that they would be extremely hard pressed to match the security that AWS can provide if they were to try to replicate that infrastructure themselves. So more and more companies choose to, if not start from scratch, if they don't have that luxury. Um, at least to start either transitioning new applications to the cloud or to build new business units on the cloud and certainly look for opportunities that are driven by um, infrastructure refresh 
support that are driven by needs to deliver content globally or to go mobile, to develop new types of analytics, all of those um, tend to be triggers in our conversations with leadership in healthcare organizations as you know, they look for opportunities to incorporate the digital agenda into their core strategy at this point. Absolutely. From a privacy and security standpoint, we've heard it from each of the panelists. So Chris, I'd like to, to put this to you. In how how is this part of the DNA of a cloud provider, cloud services provider, the considerations for privacy and security that data in the cloud? And how do we talk to our healthcare constituents about yeah, that that DNA, the fabric of privacy and security that's resident with cloud providers? Well, it, it has to be part of the DNA. I think that's a really well well. Uh, used word there. Uh, we've we've heard these buzzwords in the past: privacy by design, security by design. Um, it's difficult to some degree to do that with an on-premise cloud or an on-premise uh, co-located type of environment. But if you to build upon some of the things that Oksana mentioned, doing that in the cloud is a much more efficient, much more scalable way to do that. So, for example, you can bake into the product. Uh, certain privacy and security controls that would automate automatically scale as you scale. Uh, Matt is uh, is really good at, at helping to find the product to integrate with the AWS services that doesn't need a human to enable some of those privacy and security controls. And so the, as much automation as you can provide really makes it uh, foolproof. Uh, and, and those guardrails really help protect our customers from mistakes and, and misconfigurations, those kinds of things. In, in thinking about the decision-making process, and I'm going to pose this one to Scott initially, and thinking about the decision-making process of the on-premise versus cloud architecture, you know, Scott, how, how would you guide those decisions and do those decisions, are they different and are the decision matrix different for each of the lines of business within the healthcare industry, right? So thinking about life sciences, do they have a different decision path than a payer, than a provider? And how can we guide those, you know, how can we guide those processes to evaluate on-premise solutions versus cloud solutions? Yeah, big question there. Yeah. And uh, it really is interesting. And, and you've hit on something that I think is important. Um, I would say that uh, there is a faster pace of adoption going in order from the SaaS or technology companies have, have adopted cloud the first. Then I would say the pharma organizations, followed by the payers, and uh, lastly, the providers. And, uh, you know, I think there are different reasons for that. If, let's, let's take the providers, for instance. They, they have um, oftentimes a, a very, very cautious uh, regulatory and compliance stance be because they uh, are all about uh, patient data, of course. Um, they also have a very complex um, application architecture, you know, many, many different types of packages. Um, but even, even there, I see some great movement. We see titles now of VP of cloud or director at cloud. So there is a movement, um, even within what we might call the slower adopting portions of the market, to say it is time. We know we need to think through strategically what do we need from our IT organization? There's a demand because of healthcare change for more agility. There's a demand for greater innovation, for collaboration, and the cloud is, is an is a excellent tool to meet those strategic objectives. Um, and then as we move up the stack uh, at the very top end, uh, again, the SaaS or technology companies, they're all in uh, to technology that, that's in their DNA and um, typically don't have quite as many legacy constraints and have been able to move much more quickly to the, to the cloud and develop advanced um, methods of, of deployment like continuous integration and, and, and DevOps methods that, uh, again, really take advantage of the strategic uh, capabilities and, uh, and the technology advantages of the cloud. Excellent. Excellent. Yes, Oksana, yes, Oksana, is that your ex experience as well? Yeah, very much so. And um, I think what's interesting is that we do see a different curve um, in how rapidly the new applications can reach the market for the companies that choose to go all in, for companies that choose to go cloud first. Um, we have some very exciting um, uh, companies that build healthcare applications on AWS and
Yeah, this is Scott. I, I might just jump in because it looks yeah. like there's an audio <laughs> difficulty here. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Yeah, so, uh, and, and, you know, we work closely with AWS and uh, even Oxana personally, and, and so we are seeing those uh, technology partners who are often the early adopters, um, and, and it goes beyond just thinking about um, infrastructure as a service. There's a move now to taking advantage of, of some of the platforms that the major cloud providers are, are, are delivering, and uh, we see um, heightened abilities to automate the infrastructure. So the infrastructure is moving from, from hardware to really software, very different way of thinking. Um, and, and with that, we're seeing um, ability of, of application developers to be much more rapid in terms of their um, innovation and their ability to, to push code and, and improve um, uh, the code to, to respond to these, again, very complex needs of healthcare and, and this, this need to, to innovate, but innovate securely. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, we have a question from the audience for Matt Ferrari about the automation and the ability to innovate securely. So Christy Hoffman would like to know, Matt, can you talk more about the automation you know, that ClearData is providing around the monitoring and security? Sure. So... Scott mentioned it well, one of the key considerations whenever a healthcare organization needs to take advantage of cloud is first understanding what kind of workloads are they looking to move there and what their expectations are. So in the clear data world, since we service providers, payers, pharmaceutical companies, and healthcare IT companies, we really focus on how can we automate the considerations around security compliance for things like um, GXP, high trust, you know, those, those types of those types of things. So what we do is we take advantage, as Scott mentioned, of platforms. So um, in the AWS example, and there's examples in other clouds as well, you'll hear platform technologies such as Lambda, or the ability to use automated code to actually do just in time or create just in time needs or requirements to run and pay for just what you use or just the code that you actually execute. It's incredibly exciting for not only clear data, but healthcare organizations to be able to use that to do things like control costs as they move to cloud and as they consider um, how they can actually um, how they can actually do that over time. The neat thing that clear data does on top of that is, believe it or not, the vast majority of clear data's development IP is based on automation of security and compliance. So as AWS continues to innovate on their platform and release new services. Clear data is taking advantage of those APIs and that, that, that automation layer to actually expose to healthcare organizations things like how secure is their application and it is at all times and how compliant against our interpretation of HIPAA is that environment at all times. Incredibly important um, as organizations in healthcare constantly go through audits, but also incredibly important because as Healthcare organizations, as Scott mentioned, providers moving slower to cloud adoption move, they want to educate their staff. They want to show their, um, their traditional data center organization how they can transform to cloud without actually, you know, and, and still gain knowledge along the way. So the more that clear data can expose that automation, those services to customers, the more we can try to educate the healthcare market, but at the same time provide security and compliance for them. And, and there's another follow-up question that from the audience from Phil Leach, which is asking about the most significant challenges that cloud service providers are facing in responding to the increasing demand for these services, right? We know that the, the market continues to explode. Um, how are you responding, you and organizations like Clear Data? So uh, that's a great question. Um, I think we had this very same question last week in a big customer meeting where the, the, the concerns came up, hey, are you able to scale as we need to scale? Obviously, mm -hmm. technology can scale. How do you as an organization, as a cloud service provider, uh, help scale with that? And, and I think uh, the, the key to that is, is innovation and automation, uh, continuing to innovate up the, the, the intellectual property stack, if you will. Uh, Clear Data just released uh, in February a container platform, a HIPAA compliant container platform with full visibility in the, the HIPAA dashboards. And so, you know, if you continue to um, en enhance and embrace the automation techniques, the infrastructure as code, 
the security as code, the DevOps models. Uh, we were able to answer that question really well with, with you know, we've got a, a model where we will scale incrementally with certain people, but with our automation, we can scale much more uh, in, a, in a much more leveraged way than, than ever before in, in model. Tell us about the container platform, and I believe this is going to be a question from Matt. Talk to me more about what the container platform is and what containers as a service means to the industry. Sure. So mid-26, so containers themselves have been around for a long time. Uh, I've got a lineage of many, many years, have become more popular over the last couple of years uh, through, through technologies and organizations such as Docker. Amazon is uh, launched a container-based service called ECS, or Elastic Container Service, quite some time ago. Clear Data developed interest in it selfishly to eat our own dog food and reduce our cost for services <laughs> as we actually deployed kind of just-in-time um, resources for um, tear up and tear down. You've probably heard the terminology as uh, treating uh, servers as cattle, not pets, where you're not having to maintain security and compliance and keep your infrastructure patched and compliant as you push code. As Scott mentioned, there's tons of platform tools such as Code Deploy to actually do that today. So ClearData got into that game ourselves late last year for non-PHI or non-protected health information, thinking about how to process, store, transmit non-protected health information data. The truth, however, is that Quite a few healthcare organizations, specifically some providers and SaaS-based organizations in healthcare came to us and said, hey, could you actually layer on your security and compliance on top of that container-based solution so that I can reduce my cost by not having to pay for servers and maintenance and all of those things, but at the same time get um, PHI protected on top of the container-based service. So ClearData actually worked with those customers as well as AWS to launch a PHI capable ECS product, which we launched at HIMSS and have multiple reference customers on the platform today that you can, you can go online and read about. Excellent, excellent. And we're getting a lot of really great questions from the audience. So this is definitely uh, having, it, having an impact. So right now, our next up question is from Ganesh, who is a clear data client and would like to understand thoughts on data mining and analytics of large healthcare and life sciences customers, being able to migrate those capabilities to the cloud. So Scott, I believe this is a good question for you. Good, yes, absolutely. The analytics is, is, a, is a great place to start on the cloud. We see some of the, the most demand for our cloud services in the analytics space. Um, some examples would be a, a major national academic hospital institution, very prominent name, um, had developed an application um, and, and using the AWS services ha had developed that. And this uh, monitors neuro disease progression and it takes um, a huge volume of, of telemetry from an input device that is, and, and they are then able to gather that information in a Hadoop uh, big data environment um, in a secure AWS platform and then mine that to understand the disease progression. That's one example. Uh, we have another uh, customer who is working in the provider space and, and there's, there's a lot of collaboration that's happening in healthcare right now and analytics is um, a great place uh, where you know for for that 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 collaboration to take place. So in, in this case, we have a pharma organization who wants to monitor or help hospitals monitor um, antimicrobial resistant uh, bugs, and um, if they can help the prevent the overprescription uh, or inappropriate prescription of antibiotics, then it saves patients' lives. It reduces complications, and then um, by doing good, which they are, they also then do well because they can extend the life of their antibiotic drugs. That's another uh, big data uh, example of monitoring sepsis, for, for, for instance. We see some other um, examples with um, uh, a medical device company, for instance, that uh, post-acute care discharge um, and implantation of a device, they want to find out how is that patient doing in the home setting? And uh, from um, a big data monitoring, you can get information from bl blood pressure cuffs and scales, and then telemetry from the device itself, combine that into a Hadoop platform, and then present that 
to a nurse case manager who can then evaluate the status of the patient, can perhaps suggest that they cut back on their salt or, or recommend a medication adjustment and a visit to the physician, or if there are more urgent needs, then recommend that that patient goes to um, the emergency uh, department. So great use case examples on the analytics and big data front. Excellent. And it, it sounds like there's, we're talking about a lot of really complicated technical concepts here. And I want to elevate the conversation a little bit and go back to um, one of the opportunities for cloud. And it, it ties into a question that we have from the audience regarding the value and the benefit of migrating to the cloud and you know, the value proposition of on-prem versus, versus cloud and consideration of the resources, right? So we're talking about a tremendous amount of very skilled technical resources that are needed in order to stand up and maintain these types of environments. So thinking about that value proposition, how are you wrapping that conversation, you know, that, that on-prem versus cloud-based conversation and incorporating all of these more advanced service offerings that cloud now has uh, into that conversation? And how, how are we considering that for the healthcare clients and really clearly stating the value proposition and making sure that it is compelling? And I believe this might be a question for, uh, for Chris to start off with. It's a, it's a great topic. Um, and one that comes up a lot. So if you uh, think about scale for a moment, um, scaling a, a, let's just go back to analytics. If we are scaling a, a large uh, analytics workload, maybe we're scale, scaling vertically or, uh, or, or, or horizontally, depending on what kind of analytics solution you have. In an on-premise uh, world, uh, you can, relatively easily scale upward, adding more RAM, more compute, et cetera. But eventually you're going to hit a limit. Uh, and that limit will impact your ability to, to, uh, to build out your solution and to, to get the data that you need. Um, from, a, from a cost perspective, you, you also really have to uh, spend to the top of that, of that scalable metric, if you will. Uh, and much of the time that, that uh, excess capacity is not used. Well, AWS was able to realize that many years ago uh, when they built the, uh, the AWS cloud, uh, precisely for the reason that they needed to scale for their commerce uh, workloads, that they were able to, to offer that to the marketplace. It was a great move because now in the AWS marketplace, you can architect an analytics solution to, to not only scale vertically, but also scale horizontally which will almost be an unlimited amount of scale that you don't have to pay for until you actually consume it. So very different paradigms, uh, very different ways of approaching the ability to scale. I know that Scott and Matt also have a, a great deal of experience with these conversations, uh, but, but that's, those are the kind of discussions that we've had. Yeah, the technical, the technical architecture, architecture, Matt, I think would be very interesting to, to hear about the scalability and that technical architecture that's um, providing the value. Yeah, sure. So I'll try to try to combine a couple things here. So first you think about technical scale and value. It, it is oftentimes very cost prohibitive for small healthcare organizations to actually utilize cloud because they've got to pay things like dedicated instance fees, dedicated region fees, depending on the cloud provider, because in order to store, process, or transmit PHI, you've got to ensure that um, you can identify where the PHI lives. Um, right. There are multiple solutions around that. From a technical architecture, for there are many cloud service providers, and including ClearData, that has built an, a multi-tenant based architecture that still provides isolation from a network, VPN, and security perspective to protect the customer's uh, PHI, while at the same time avoiding the organization or the healthcare customer having to pay for the entire full boat of, uh, of having to have dedicated instances or dedicated region fees tacked onto their bill. That's, that becomes very important, a very important consideration as think, people think about value. The second one that I'd say that we haven't really touched on is really agility. Mm -hmm. The truth is by taking advantage of automation, of APIs, of the things that are exposed in the cloud, you're reducing your time to market significantly. Uh, Scott has mentioned multiple healthcare examples. I'll give you one that I heard maybe about a month ago. I was on site at a hospital and a provider where they're discussing a four to six week lead time to deploy new services inside of their facilities. 
by being able to leverage a cloud, they're simply calling an API or logging into a portal, clicking a couple buttons, assigning an asset ID or a cost code to make sure that the appropriate department in the hospital is getting charged and the organization has a PHI capable environment in a couple hours, if not less. Um, so to drive down that kind of cost internally, while oftentimes seen as soft costs, turn out to be real ones. Absolutely. And it's interesting on the agility front and thinking about automation and APIs. In a prior life, I was deeply involved in the Meaningful Use Stage 2 race to, you know, race to achieve interoperability where interoperability had been expressly prohibited, right, in the original architecture of all the legacy systems that prop up healthcare. So interoperability as a service and being able to provide um, you know, interoperable cloud-based solutions has a tremendous value, both from a resource perspective as well as from a technology perspective. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of echo that I, I think that the value proposition is much deeper than just sim you know, the, the simple technology architecture, that business process automation and the, that agility, especially when we think about those types of complex processes where, where you've seen one EMR implementation, you've seen one EMR implementation. Um, it, it's, it's tremendous, it's huge. Awesome. We have several more questions that are coming in, and one of them is, is kind of a high level, and this is a, a discussion for, um, I, I believe this is a discussion for Chris here, thinking about what are the really key components, if we're thinking, considering you know, cloud providers, what are the, the most important things that we should be considering in our business associate agreements with an MSP, with a managed service provider? Yes. Uh these are these are uh, agreements that every healthcare organization in the United States uh, is required to have with a uh, cloud provider, for example, or, or other vendors um, that may touch PHI, uh, protected health information. And uh, you know, so a couple of things I look at. I I negotiate these with our customers on a daily basis. Um, some of the things that I would look for if I was looking for a cloud provider is how do I delineate a security event from a breach notification event. Uh, what are those notification periods? What am I brought into the, to the security incident process to ensure that, uh, for example, I'm part of the investigation as a customer? Uh, one of the last things that a customer wants to hear is a, a cloud provider calling them and saying, hey, by the way, you had a breach. Well, um, we've learned over many years of doing this uh, that a, a breach is not a legal or is not a, an IT declaration. It's a legal declaration. So right. lawyers have to be involved in that. The other is really um, around uh, indemnification. Uh, does that live in the master agreement? Does that live in the, um, the business associate agreement? Uh, duty to mitigate uh, issues that they see. Some business associate agreements just say we don't have the responsibility to do that. You do, um, but your cloud service provider should fix something that they see is, is problematic in your environment, even if you're not able to come to the phone and, and do that. So that should be a very proactive uh, part of that. So there's, there's quite a few different things I would consider. Those are some of the most important ones. Uh, the other is uh, ensuring that uh, uh, the prior provider can cover you if they screw something up. For lack of <laughs> Right. Oksana, welcome back. I, I appreciate that there were some technical difficulties, but do you have anything to add to this discussion around how you consider the components of a BAA, you know, of the agreement? Sure. Um, and, and for us, it falls into the overall uh, shared responsibility model when we think both about security and compliance, and BAA is a very important component of that. So to us, it's really important that the services that we provide are used in a way that we consider conservatively um, the right way for managing and protecting the patient information. So encryption, address, and in motion, extremely important. Um, the uh, traceability of data, very important, especially not just even on the, just on the HIPAA side, but also on the GXP side, where we are supporting our customers in life sciences now increasingly to help them build regulated applications um, and get, get them into an audit ready state. And um, uh, yeah, so definitely both customers and partners that sign DAs with us um, understand how to engineer right. We can also provide support programs and um, engineering time to help build applications the right way and consistent with the BAA. And of course, you know, when we talk about HIPAA and BAA compliance, it's for, 
applications and services that launch in the U.S. There is also additional regulatory frameworks that are going to apply in EMEA, in APAC, and other, in other parts of the world. And these are, again, very complicated conversations to be having. So I, I'd like to put a question to the audience members here and allow them to uh, respond in the chat window. And you know, are these you know, security considerations, are these BAA considerations, are these already part of your framework? Are these already part of your decision matrix for cloud-based solutions? Uh, and, and if not, is there some specific opportunity for you to take back into your organization and address some of the things that we've been discussing? So as we continue our conversation, I, I'd like to hear from the audience and understand from a security perspective, how are they taking advantage of the types of things that we've just discussed with respect to how those uh, framework needs to be included in the agreements? Um, Oksana, there's a, a conversation that we, we missed, unfortunately, when you had technical difficulties that I'd like to make sure I revisit and allow you to, to chime in on. Regarding the resourcing and regarding the complexity of this environment and all of the technical solutions that we're talking about and the types of physical human resources and the skill sets that are required in order to address these in consideration from a value proposition standpoint, you know, there's, there are questions about startups. So we're, we're getting some questions from the audience about the value proposition and about understanding how to best evaluate you know, on-prem versus cloud solutions. Um, from a resourcing perspective. And I wanted to, to tap you and ask for your feedback on kind of the human resource component of that decision. And how do you think about that at AWS? Sure. I would say the main resourcing question is about, you know, is there that know-how within your organization to build yourself from scratch? And frequently, you know, in, in startups, it's not unusual to, uh, to have a few people that grow and whose expertise grows over time um, and grows along with the organization. In larger uh, companies, frequently you're going to have people who are a lot more familiar with other worlds and with the legacy IT world. And um, that's when a lot of companies turn towards um, consulting um, uh, partners, turn towards organizations that already have built that know-how. We also, um, you know, we, we engage very closely with our customers as much as we can to provide training, to provide um, AWS immersion days, to, um, to provide innovation days, if that's the type of application and the type of perspective that a, a company is coming through. But definitely, whenever you talk about organizational capacity, partners such as Clear Data are an extremely important part of the equation. Absolutely, absolutely. And it sounds like, again, kind of getting back to the overarching framework, and this is gonna be a Scott question, you know, many of these questions and considerations that we have are strategic in nature and they're, you know, we're, we're getting at how do you establish and develop and work collaboratively with the clients um, to create a cloud strategy that's going to work for the size of the organization and the scope of the projects that are being undertaken. Yeah, uh, you know, these are conversations that I enjoy and, um, and we're, we're very active in these where customers will ask or prospects or just, just colleagues, how do I get started? And, yep. and I would say that virtually all um, are it ready. They're at least ready to explore. And uh, you, you know, I, I think you hit on it is, is look at your strategic objectives. Um, the cloud is an important move. You wanna make sure that you have sponsorship, I think outside of IT, you right. will need financial sponsorship, from the CFO perhaps, um, you know, strategic or business or clinical sponsorship so that they are supportive. And you know, good IT leaders understand that and they're gonna collaborate with those uh, colleagues and they're gonna understand the uh, strategic priorities. Again, is it innovation? Um, do we have competitive threats? Do we need to move into a space of, let's call it co-opetition, where you're going to be collaborating with a, a, an organization that is sometimes a, uh, a competitor? And um, if you understand those drivers, as well as, um, things like the cost pressures that, that you're facing um, and, and, the, and the pressure to move ever faster, then you can um, start to identify applications. Sometimes they're old applications that have been depreciated and you can get them onto a less expensive cloud platform. Um, uh, on the other hand, using that filter of those uh, strategic priorities, you might choose to uh, move a net new application. And again, I think there's a lot of those uh, um, analytics, uh, collaboration, patient engagement, uh, digital strategies that oftentimes move to the cloud because they're greenfield. So they don't have any of um, 
um, the, kind of the, the legacy of warts, if you will, that uh, constrain them from moving to the cloud. So I think you, you, you link the strategies, the cost issues, and the technical readiness of both the application and then your team. Um, oftentimes in, in these conversations, it's good to have a conversation with somebody who's been there before. You know, talk with your colleagues who've done it, uh, talk with service providers, some security experts, technologists who uh, have, have, you know, maybe have some battle scars and to, who understand uh, the pitfalls and uh, the, the real benefits and upsides and you can accelerate your journey. Absolutely. So if, if what I heard and captured from what you just said, from a strategic perspective, if we look at the high level, you want to understand the business priorities, you want to understand the costs involved, you want to understand the technology considerations, and then I've tacked on the, the privacy and security requirements that you would have. So in that vein, you know, sending this over to Matt to talk first about the technology considerations. So if we're thinking about the questions that we would need to ask ourselves organizationally as we develop a cloud strategy, what are some of those technical considerations? What's the readiness that we need to address? Sure. So some of the readiness considerations that we walk when we walk into a healthcare organization is how starts with how do they protect their PHI today? Um, how do they do encryption? How do they uh, focus on identity and access management. Who do they provide identity and access management to? Um, how do they how do they facilitate um, access control requests? How do they run change management inside of their organization when new code is pushed or when maintenance windows occur? How are they notified um, across the organization when these changes do happen? In many cases, um, what happens is you'll see a healthcare cloud service provider work, work with healthcare organizations to develop this plan. Oftentimes, it is known as building out a RACI, or who is responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed for each and every technical or business component that uh, leads the architecture into, uh, into a cloud-based solution. Scott mentioned it well. The vast majority of traction that we see are with greenfield or net new development um, workloads, whether it be a, an EMR or a mobile application that, that is rewriting your application inside the cloud. But the truth is there are legacy workloads as well. There are requirements around things like, uh, things like encryption that apply both to legacy workloads and net new workloads. And AWS and other cloud service providers have specific technical covered services that are covered by the Amazon BAA or Business Associates Agreement. Someone like a clear data or other service providers take advantage of those technical services to be able to build out uh, what we would call a reference architecture of how would the actual PHI flow through the, through the underlying application or underlying architecture and main compliant at all times. But it really starts with how do I get an assessment of what does the environment look like today? Right, absolutely. And I think, Oksana, I was going to have you chime in there as well from a technical consideration standpoint. Yes, I think, um, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting dialogue that um, happens with customers. And typically it starts with, um, agree, yes, what are you using today? Um, and uh, I, I would say over time in recent uh, couple years, the topic of, you know, auditability, traceability, control, um, has been uh, pretty high up on the agenda for a lot of executives. And when you start looking at the process as is today, frequency on paper, hidden in a cabinet, with uncertain access, uh, unclear um, history of who's had access to what data when, it becomes clear very, very quickly that um, introducing controls at scale, introducing predictable environments that are programmed. So you're talking about compliance of code. Um, makes a tremendous amount of difference. So you actually can achieve a much greater degree of control, but also much greater degree of visibility, the ability to manage by signal as opposed to try to control noise, the ability to look back um, if needed and understand exactly what the environment looks like, you know, January one, three years ago. What were the services? What were the instances? What, you know, who had access to the environment? Right. Um, this, this degree of control is impossible to achieve with existing systems. And it's funny, so I think we're touching on the, the next component of this, so I, I'm going to kick this over to Chris to talk about kind of the privacy and security considerations that should be part of your cloud strategy. So Chris, you want to add on? Absolutely. Uh, Matt said it very well. 
uh, around the plan for addressing where the data is at, where how it flows, how it, how the existing architecture is is uh, listed and and is described. I think Oksana uh, took it a step further as well with compliance as code, and that's a it's not just a buzzword, but mm -hmm. when a cloud provider like Clear Data looks to a partner, we look for those that are mature in their APIs and their, and their other service offerings that let us use those APIs to build in compliance checks into our code as well. So that was a great add. I think the other part of that is that the HHS HIPAA specifically requires a security risk assessment uh, by healthcare organizations as well as their subcontractors. And so where those exist, um, we try to use those to help build the plan that Matt was talking about. We use those indicators, we use those gaps that we see uh, in those plans to uh, help address those challenges that our, our, our customers have. Where they don't exist, we provide them um, because we, we understand you know, exactly what those safeguards have to be. But automating that, again, going back to automation, uh, using those, uh, those requirements from HHS and HIPAA and understanding how the OCR wants to audit when they decide to do that, we, we need to build in those, those, those data points like Oksana described. What does that environment look like over time? Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny, so you've, you've mentioned, and I think all of us, we've, we have all been touching on, on HIPAA. We've all been touching on the privacy and security and compliance. And Scott mentioned engagement as an opportunity for cloud technologies. And you know, all of these protections exist for, you know, for us to secure um, and, and safely house and, and engage with PHI. So this is another question for the audience. I'd like to understand how many of our audience members are leveraging some type of cloud solution in order to engage their patients or their members or you know, part of a clinical trial. Um, so if you're using cloud-based technologies to enable engagement with, you know, with your members, with your patients, please let us know and please let us know if you have any um, questions or opportunities that we should address around those particular types of strategies. So I want to send this back over to Scott and talk specifically about that use case and talk about the opportunity for the cloud to foster and en enable that type of very close person-to-person -person engagement using, you know, appropriately PHI. Right. So, um, and, and Chris has done a lot of work in this space. Um, you know, it's interesting when you have person-to-person -person, uh, uh, conversations or engagement, um, oftentimes that's actually not covered by HIPAA mm -hmm. because there are other elements that are required there. For instance, are you, um, it's, it's the type of data and the nature of the conversation and the parties that are um, in the conversations, for instance, is, is one of those parties a covered entity or a business associate, then more likely that, that it is covered by HIPAA. If it's more of a, let's call it, you know, patients like me sort of conversation, mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, you can talk with your friend and, and, and text or email and even use an app. And, and again, typically, um, that's not covered by HIPAA because that, that's a personal conversation instead of um, healthcare covered conversation. And part of why I bring this up is there can be times when there are gradients. You know, when you first engage, let's say with a hospital or even a payer, you may be engaging as a consumer. Um, that uh, probably is not covered by HIPAA. Right. Then the conversation starts to flow where you are asking uh, a covered entity specific medical questions, and then, and then it, 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 that conversation flips. So what you need, you, you need someone like a Chris Bowen who, um, or, or a healthcare uh, attorneys, who understand those very important subtleties and can 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 provide you good uh, good advice? Someone who's been through that before. So um, all that said, um, it, it really shouldn't put a wet blanket on collaboration. I think we're we're all realizing that um, consumers and patients are some of the biggest drivers of both healthcare cost and healthcare outcome. So if we can harness the power of patients, which is really all of us, then um, we can make a difference individually in our own healthcare and, and help drive out cost. And I think this uh, collaboration sharing experiences is, is an important part of that. And um, there's tremendous um, venture and entrepreneurial effort um, in this space. So, uh, and it's it, all of that is very right for the cloud, again, provided that you've got good guidance on 
um, the security, privacy, and compliance aspect. And, and, and you know, when we're talking about HIPAA, that's in the United States. Um, many of these initiatives, uh, th there are global needs and demands mm -hmm. here, and, and many of these needs, there are differences in, in how uh, PII, uh, more likely, is viewed in, in other continents than, uh, than here in the United States. Well, and it's interesting, so I'll, I'll push this over to Chris, because we have a, a request for clarification around when we're talking about PHI and, and HIPAA, you know, going into detail about the, the types of identification and whether de-identification is, you know, is the most appropriate and uh, optimal solution all the time. So Chris, if you, if you could kind of give us a little bit more clarification when we're having this discussion around PHI and HIPAA, what's covered and not covered, and making sure that we are being as compliant as possible for the use cases that we're discussing. Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, the, the short answer on de-identified data is usually it can be re-identified somehow. Yeah. Um, if you just look at the University of Texas Austin's study from uh, uh, some of those use cases, 83% of the time they could re-identify data. So uh, to compensate for those kinds of things, you, what you need to remember is minimum necessary principles apply not only in how much data you collect and use, but also the, the amount of data that you retain. So your retention policies come into play. You shouldn't be keeping data forever just because you might need it sometime. The, the data really needs to be retained and used and uh, even collected in a way that's consistent with the uh, patient's or the, in, in many cases the consumer's uh, consent. Uh, in Europe, this is becoming a much bigger deal uh, with the right to be forgotten, the right to uh, other things with GDPR that are coming up, um, but even in your your you know data lifecycle policies, Amazon provides some great abilities to 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 destroy data, to get rid of data in your S3 buckets, for example, using lifecycle management uh, in those uh, in those policy settings, so that you don't have to remember, hey, I've got to go delete you know 1969's data. Right. Uh, that's an important component. Oksana, would you like to elaborate on that? Sure. Um, I think, and, and I guess to the, to the greater question of, you know, the data life cycle and what happens over time, um, completely right. You, you have a lot of control, both fr from the very uh, moment of data creation all the way through access points. Um, so with the fine-grained identity control uh, measures, for example, companies can define exactly who can access what between what hours and if they log in from a specific geography event. So, um, so I would say it's um, establishment of policy and then compliance with policy at scale that, that I actually think even feeds back somewhat to that conversation we had earlier about talent because one of the things that those programmatic guardrails allow an organization to do is to not force everybody to shore up their own thinking. They can be creative, they can try new ideas and let the system be smart about compliance and let the system you know, figure out what's in and out of boundaries. At the same time, people get that safe box where they can play and, and really be creative. Absolutely, absolutely. Matt, do you have anything to add? Uh, I think I think Oksana said it very well. I think it's all about kind of that creativity on the technology side. Look, um, cloud providers are releasing new technologies almost each and every day, and the vast majority of them, while not covered by a business associates agreement today, are rapidly moving into that direction. So the opportunity for innovation and creativity when thinking about safeguarding PHI as as well as other um, important information or sensitive data is, is growing each and every day. Excellent. Well, I, I, that leads me into a really perfect segue. We've got five minutes left in this webinar, and I'd like to do a little bit of a lightning round, round robin, um, for what the evolution of cloud means to each one of you, kind of what, how you've seen this space change in the last five years, how you perceive it to be changing in the next five years, and kind of what are you most looking forward to? And Scott, I think I, you're the, you're up first. Okay, um, I love this question. And, you know, I, I enjoy meeting with uh, some leaders and, and sometimes it's behind closed doors and they can talk really openly. I had one national provider CIO recently um, in this very conversation. And he said, Scott, within five years, I don't wanna have any data centers. He, he said, that is not, 
core to our mission of healthcare delivery and, and serving our communities. Uh, now he realized that that was a journey, uh, but he wanted to take the steps. And this is a provider CIO, mind you. So um, I do see that uh, continual move to seeking partners who focus and are excellent on things that you don't focus on. And uh, now that doesn't mean that we won't still need um, IT leaders and infrastructure knowledgeable people within healthcare organizations. We absolutely will. It's just that they're gonna have to have knowledge now of how do I understand, you know, architect, design, um, perhaps manager or monitor my partnership network uh, uh, and, uh, and cloud service providers, for instance. So I think it's, it's gonna be a great journey. And I think it's a great journey, um, again, for us as we're driven to, to improve healthcare outcomes and decrease healthcare costs. Wonderful. Chris, anything to add? Absolutely. Uh, Scott said it very well. Uh, Scott used to be a customer of clear data in full <laughs> disclosure. And uh, it's, it's great to have him here. I think, uh, I think the journey is going to be a, a very interesting one where we're starting to talk less and less. And you said it at the beginning of this, Mandy, uh, less and less about security and compliance and more and more about innovation and, um, and, and serving our patients. In this journey from clear data from day one to today, uh, you know, the vision has remained the same, and that is to help the ecosystem of healthcare save lives. And there's a lot of ways to do that using technology and enabling uh, the destruction of data silos and, and enabling secure sharing and, and, and gain of of massive amounts of knowledge from, from healthcare if they use the cloud uh, correctly. And I've seen that trend over and over in those same kind of conversations that Scott just mentioned. Wonderful. Oksana, what about you? Well, I think to me, um, in, in generally, if I think back to the philosophy at AWS and at Amazon more broadly, uh, the number one thing is working back from a customer. And in healthcare, I think what's tremendously energizing, energizing for me every single day is that the ultimate customer for all those systems and tools that you build is a patient. So that's why it's important to get compliance right. It's there for a reason. We're in the regulated industry for a reason. And uh, once, when we solve for that, all those exciting and innovative things like connected health, IoT, advanced analytics to support decision making in many new ways, innovative product development, all of that is happening and will continue to happen at a large scale and faster going forward. Excellent. Matt, take us home. So talking about innovation for a second, Chris, Chris and Oksana just said it. The truth is, two years ago, every time I'd have to speak in a webinar or get on stage, I was talking about security and compliance every single time. And the truth is that we've overcome that. And now we're talking about how do we actually expose logs? How do we expose um, all of the capabilities that AWS and, and other providers may have in the market out into the wild so that healthcare organizations can either ingest it themselves or that so they can lean on a cloud service provider to actually provide the support on it. The truth now is, since innovation was mentioned, the truth is um, one, of, one of you actually asked the question that we didn't get a chance to answer, answer which was around serverless. The truth is that we are headed in a direction where we are treating um, infrastructure as code more and more. We are moving away from traditional Windows, Linux, server deployments and maintenance. And we are moving more towards that container-based and eventually serverless-based technology. Whilst most serverless technologies are not yet covered by a business associates agreement, know that that's where gravity is. Um, and, uh, and what you're going to see from an innovation perspective to drive down costs, to increase agility, to move more healthcare organizations into the cloud is the ability to use those kind of technologies moving forward. Excellent. Well, these, this has been really fantastic insights. I'm, I'm thankful for all of you for joining us today, as well as thankful to everyone who has stayed on with us. Um, this has been amazing brain power and excellent insight. So as a reminder to everyone, the key topics, questions and answers will be curated and made available in a follow-up communication. So expect to hear from us. So thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you to our audience members. We're out. <laughs>